you know, and, and it makes me crazy. That that really is one of my hot buttons. I'm sorry, for men to not be men and women to not be women, but but it is something that can be taught. Okay, so I'm probably way off now, but uh, hopefully that hopefully that helped. But what leadership? We're talking about leadership, uh, making these decisions. Yes, men, it is your default position to make those decisions, but you would be filled with wisdom to take your wife's input. Uh, and I, can, I could give you a dozen illustrations of that in my own personal life, but you probably have your own. So. But what leadership is, is it's, it's, Christ's, um, it's Christ's example. Christ gave us the example of leadership. Uh, <coughs> He, he led by character. He, led, he, he gave us the example to love. Do you remember when he was dealing with Peter uh, in his leadership and his love for, for Peter? Peter denied him three times, and there in John 20, he gave Peter three opportunities to be restored. Peter, do you love me? Peter had said, I don't know you. I don't know him. I don't know him. Cursings and cursings. I don't know him. Three times he denied him the night Jesus was crucified. And then in John 20, three times Jesus uh, comes to the Apostle Peter and says, Okay, Peter, let's get this right. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And so Peter was restored. And it wasn't because Peter came to him. It was because Jesus came to, to Peter. And so even when our, in that part of leadership, even when our wives have offended us, we need to go to them to make that restoration as, as Christ's example. Christ loved us when we were unlovely. He loved us in an unconditional way. That's his role of leadership. That's the way he leads. He leads in love. There are times when he has ha- had to lead with rebuke. As he looked at Peter again, he says, Get behind me, Satan. He's, he had to rebuke his disciples. Uh, can you not stay awake with me for one hour? But yet, even in that, he loved them and showed them compassion. Uh, leadership is something that is, that is uh, practical. Uh, it's, it's not, leadership in the family is not self-focused. It is family-focused. It's a, it's a dying to self as, as Christ did. Uh, it's an example of self-control. Uh, it examples, it's, a, it's an example of priority. When, when we are leading the way we should be leading, we, we are expressing our priorities. Uh, oftentimes we lead badly and, we, and our priorities get way out of whack. When we're leading selfishly, uh, it's really of no value to the family. When, we, when a husband is leading properly, he's leading... Uh, in a loving way, as Christ's example is given to us. And when a husband is leading, he's leading in humility. I, I, get, I have very little patience. I have very, very little patience to the, to the men who, who take the passages in Ephesians 5. It says, because you are the head of the home, you're the head of the wife. And they, they beat their chest, you know, and they show their chest hair. And they, they, they you know, that's ridiculous. Being the head means that you are responsible for the sanctification of your home. All that it means is that you are the you are the responsible party. The buck stops with you. It does. It gives you no right to be a to be an authoritarian, to be a uh, to be a dictator, or to abuse your family, or to get your way in everything. It doesn't give you that right. It means that you are the leader, and with leadership comes responsibility. Also, it means uh, to lead, like I said, lead in humility. But it also means to lead uh, in a way that you are, how do you say this? In a way that you're pleasant to live with. You know, we find it pretty easy to bark, don't we? Pretty easy to bark. That does not make us easy to live with. Uh, I know my wife, I, I think my wife is hypersensitive about some things, but she's probably not. It's just I'm not sensitive enough to her needs that, uh, that I can be coarse at times. And 
practically speaking, what leadership is, is leading in a spiritual way, leading our family spiritually. If you don't have a time of family worship, can I just, I don't know how to encourage you enough to have a time of family worship. And I'm not, and I'm not talking about just uh, uh, three points in a poem and, and then give an invitation and pass the plate I, or, or a seminary lecture, okay? But taking some time as a family to worship. You know those cliches that happen because they happen? The family that prays together stays together. You've heard that? That's very true. If your children don't know that worshiping God is important to dad, it's not going to be important to them. And no matter how many words you use, if they don't see God important in your life, it's not going to be a big deal to them. It's going to be an intellectual exercise that's really going to produce no fruit. They've got to see it lived out in your life. The best way to do that is for them to see you get excited about the truths of God's Word, for you to get excited about what God's doing in your own life. Let me tell you how God answered this prayer. You know, honey, sit down. Let me tell you what God did today. Let me tell you what's happening in my life right now. Or, honey, wife, daughter, son, what's the Lord doing in your life today? You know, how can I pray for you? How can how can uh, what can I what can I do for you? Uh, fill in the blank there to to help you grow. You know. So leading is a spiritual adventure as well. Uh, when we, uh, I'm sorry, let me close this. I don't have the little. So husbands who, are, husbands who are going to be like Christ are going to be the things that we've talked about, self-sacrificing, they're going to be giving, they're going to be willing to lay down their life, including laying down their time for their wife to, to converse. Let me back up to that one more. Let me just tell you one more illustration that actually came to pass in, in my life, in, in our life. Uh, I, I'm a recovering workaholic. Okay, I love to work. I would rather work than play. And I know that sounds bizarre. I would, though. I would rather work than play. Um, it just gives me a sense of accomplishment. When I get something done, I'm like, yeehaw. I'm ready to, that's an Alabama term for those of you that have never been to Alabama. But, but I'm excited about that. And when, it, when my wife and I first got married, I gave myself all these excuses of I go to work and I stay at work and I stay at work and I stay at work because I'm, su I'm supplying for my family. I'm a good Christian man. I'm making a living for my family. And my wife was becoming more and more and more and more discontent with our marriage because I wasn't investing there. I was investing in, in this area. Yes, I was fulfilling this narrow slice of responsibility, but I wasn't fulfilling the broader role that I have as a man and as a husband. Okay, some of you probably gone through the same thing. And she would she would not be happy if I were going anywhere because I wasn't spending near the time with her that I should have. I repented of that. And what was the I mean this was really great. There was a time that uh that she said, "Honey, would would you go to work?" Would, would you go do something else besides just being around here? And I, find, I said, okay, whew, we're at that place. We fill that cup back up. And so now I'm trying to work that balance of not enough and not too much. But if we're, if we're too busy as men for our wives, it's, she is, it's going to cause a lot of conflict because she wants us to be there. We don't, we don't think of it that way very often. But our wives want our attention. They married us because we gave them attention. We gave them love. Okay? We need to still be doing that in our marriage. And if, if that is found in a balance, you won't have a problem 
if you want to go do something some week night, she's not going to have a problem with that. She's not going to pitch a fit about that because you have filled her cup of, of loving up to the place where she's satisfied with you. You anyway, know, I said all that. I just wanted to make that point, make that sure. You guys have any questions or comments? Yes, sir. But, okay, passage that you quoted out of Second Corinthians, it says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The yoking there, it's, it's a reference to a passage in Deuteronomy where it talks about not plowing with uh, an ox and a donkey. I, if, I, I am from Alabama. My, dad was, my grandfather was a truck farmer. I have plowed behind a mule before. Um, it, it, it's an unreasonable expectation to, to yoke up a donkey and an ox. Uh, an ox is a clean animal. A donkey is an unclean animal. An ox is very strong. A, a, a donkey is strong, but not like the ox. And it's just, I mean, leg, leg length, everything, everything is off. You're looking for catastrophe if you link those two up. And what Paul is saying there is don't, don't enter into a work uh, with an unbeliever. Don't let them be your most intimate friends. Let me tell you what he's not saying there. Uh, when, uh, to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, I believe it was. My brain's really tired, I'm sorry. But he said, <clears throat> when I wrote to you and said, don't keep company with the sexually immoral, I did not mean for you to not keep company with the sexually immoral or the extortioners or the, of this world, because in order to do that, you have to go out of this world. So what Paul is saying there is, I, I didn't mean for you to isolate yourself, insulate yourself from unconverted people. Okay? Um, interesting thing, though, he said, but I did say if a man calls himself a brother, that you don't even eat with him. we we'll look at that maybe in a minute. But, but Paul's point was there, you, if, if you're going to evangelize, you have to rub elbows with the lost. You can even be a friend to the lost. But in 2 Corinthians, he says, don't yoke up in work with those. Don't be, pulling, try, don't be trying to pull in the same direction as the unconverted, okay? Because in doing so, you are, you are begging for, you're just calling for catastrophe, Okay? Uh, it wasn't a matter of speaking to them, befriending them, evangelizing them, helping them, you know, ministering to them, counseling them, weeping with them, loving them. It wasn't that matter. It was just a matter of yoking up with them. Okay, And in a marriage situation, it's, you know, God allows that to happen sometimes when you have two people that get married and, and one becomes a Christian. But he also dealt with that in 1 Corinthians 7. But if you have your, if you have the option, if you're a Christian, first thing on your list, if you're looking for a wife, it has to be, is she truly converted? Because your marriage will, will, it will never, it will never grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ until she becomes a Christian. I don't know if that helped, but that was right. On, that was right on the tip of your tongue, wasn't it, brother? All right. What time do we stop? No, for now. Okay, and what time is it? Five till. Okay, well we can we can stop now then. I, I think if we had a few more minutes, we could cover a little bit. But I think we're all kind of tired. If I'm speaking for myself, I'm a little bit tired. But uh, uh, is there anything else that that needs to be said or could be helpful? Uh, it sounds like we're talking so much about friendship evangelism and um, 
me being you know, a close, intimate friend who spends a lot of time with a person who's an unbeliever and has things or ways of being, whether it's an effeminate uh, way of, of living or, or whatever it may be, um, that's going to be extremely uncomfortable and very hard for me. And the question I need to ask myself is, is God calling me to do that? There's some very difficult things that God has called me to, and there's other difficult things that I'm doing and are outside of God's will completely. Um, so there, there, there may be circumstances where uh, that is a challenge that God has not even called us to do. I mean, having a, a, a close intimate relationship with someone who's rebelling against God, I, I don't know that that's something that I'm, I'm called to do from, uh, from Scripture, and yet I am called to, to preach the gospel to them. Mm-hmm. You know, in that in that passage um, where Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and he says that I didn't tell you to not have anything to do with the sexually immoral extortioners, you know, that covetous idolaters, that sort of thing. Um, he was not at that point giving liberty to make them your best friend either. Okay, you have to come to a balance. Um, our best friends and our fellowship, our, our social circle really ought to be brothers. Cause, but one thing that he did say, and this is way off topic here, but in that text, he said, if someone is called a brother who is an extortioner or sexually immoral, or, and he gives the list of things there, he said, not, so, not even to eat with them. I think there's two reasons that he says that. One is for the shame and discipline of that brother to show him his erring ways. But the other is if you spend a lot of time with Christians, uh, and particularly, can I, can I encourage you if your children, you, those of you who have children, don't let them become best friends with the unconverted world or, or with a Christian who you know is not uh, striving to do God's will because here's what, here's what is the pro- part of a tendency that they have. They claim to be a Christian, yet they live like the world. And we get this idea, we don't consider the fact that they're not Christians. We consider the fact that they have this liberty to live in this particular sin. So it begins to affect us. So, well, they're a Christian and they can do that. They say they're a Christian and they love God and they can do that. So I'm a Christian, I love God, why can I not do that? And, we'll be, and it will begin to work compromise in us where we should not have compromise. So it's real important, those, those that we are the closest to really need to be Christian people. We need to see, we need to see the unconverted as lost and opportunities for evangelism and opportunities for God's grace. I know that sounds kind of shallow, but we we just need to be really careful who we spend our time with because we do we are affected by those that we spend a lot of time with, and it can it can lead us to serious and significant compromise. Right. Who let you in here? Uh, man. Uh, I can I can give you some I can give you some possibilities, okay? Uh, I, I'm not the end all to, to answer that question. But you always want to speak with grace and truth no matter who you're talking to. 
Um, if they are truly assuming that they're Christians, a couple things you've got to know. You're not going to just convince them into the kingdom. The Spirit of God has to bring them into the kingdom. But if you'll approach them, if you'll approach them with questions and make them think through the questions, you're going to stand a lot better chance on your part, doing your part in that, than saying, listen, Buster, the Word of God says that you're unconverted. Okay, well, they're going to go, you just lost your audience, Okay. But you're a Christian, you're a Christian, I'm a Christian. I, help me understand something. You know, in John here it says that um, if a man says that he, that he loves God and hates his brother, he's lying. And uh, I hear a lot of spewing venom coming out of your mouth. So how do you reconcile those two things? Or we know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. You don't seem to love Christian people and Christian things. So can you help me understand here how that works? Um, you know, particularly that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. That's, just not, that's not just talking about loving good people. That's talking about loving being around genuine Christians practicing genuine Christianity. You, you don't like that. So, so how, how, is it, how do you reconcile saying that you're a Christian? I just want to know. And make them think through it. Now they may they may come up defensive. You know, who are you to judge me? All of the stuff that you hear, that's not your problem. Your 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 issue is to as much as you're responsible for live at peace with all men. Please visit our website at heartcrymissionary.com. There you will find information about the ministry, our purpose, beliefs and methodologies and extensive information about the missionaries we are privileged to serve.